Good evening, everyone. My name is Ware Harmon. I'm the Executive Director of Town Hall Seattle. On behalf of the rest of the team here and our friends at Third Place Books, it's a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's virtual presentation of Jeff Mano and Nicola Twilley, part of our Arno Matulski Science Lecture Series. As we get underway, I want to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, and particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. We are very glad you're back with us at the start of another season here at Town Hall. It's our 22nd, but you can be assured this will be a year unlike any other, featuring in-person events, virtual events, and something we're calling hybrid events, and I can explain them, but you can probably figure out what we mean by that. We've also re recently reimagined our podcast in the moment, where Jenny Palmer, Steve Scher, and other local correspondents will conduct exclusive interviews of authors, artists, and newsmakers. And also, our many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form in our digital media library. In some, there are many, many ways to engage with Town Hall in this sort of strange year. Back to tonight's event, though. It'll run 50 to 60 minutes, we think, including Q&A. To integrate our in-person and virtual audience experiences, we changed the Q&A platform uh, for our events this year. To submit your question, please uh, type meet.ps th quarantine. I should say meet.ps forward slash th quarantine. You can also just scan the QR code right now on the screen with your smartphone, and we'll drop the link in the chat. It'll all make sense in the fullness of time. We can't guarantee we'll get to every question, but we'll try to get to as many as possible, and you can help us by keeping your own question concise. For those of you who'd like to view the program with closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming events include a discussion of growing older without growing sicker with Dr. Nir Barzilai and Dr. Lee Hood. Fascinating look at the natural history of the heart with Bill Shute. A long, uh, I should say a look at the long and occasionally risky history of medical innovation with Paul A. Offit, and the return of town hall favorite Thor Hansen, discussing how creatures big and small are trying to adapt to climate change. Check our website or join our email list to get the latest updates as more programs are added throughout the season. Town Hall's programs are made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Arno Matulski Science Lecture Series is supported by Microsoft, the Caffin Foundation, and the Wincote Foundation Northwest. But as most of you know, Town Hall is at heart a member-supported organization, and I want to thank all of our members watching from home tonight. Last, you may think that you know what there is to know about quarantines after all this time, but I can assure you, you'll want to dive deeper into tonight's timely topic by purchasing a copy of Twilly and Mano's book. Please use the link in the chat below or alongside wherever it's appearing on your pane to pick up your copy through third place books. And with that, Jeff Mano is a Los Angeles based freelance writer covering topics related to cities, design, infrastructure, technology, and more for the New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, The Guardian, Wired, and other publications. His fascinating previous book, A Burglar's Guide to the City, looks at a building through the eyes of someone hoping to break into it. If that sounds like good informative fun, it is. Uh, Nicola Twilley is co-host of the award-winning podcast Gastropod, which looks at food through the lens of history and science. A regular contributor to The New Yorker, she's currently working on a book about refrigeration. While both authors' books are impressive for their unexpected contemplation of timeless ideas, their latest book is equally timeless but could not be more locked into this cultural moment. Until proven safe, the history and future of quarantine has been called engrossing, entertaining, timely, and important by Dr. Tom Frieden, former director of the CBC, and Dr. Frieden would presumably know. So please join me in welcoming Nicola Twilley and Jeff Mano. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks. We're thrilled to be here. Yeah, it's great to be back. Um, the last I was in Seattle uh, five years ago was actually uh, at Town Hall Seattle for a uh, talk about Burglar's Guide. So it's, it's really good to be back here and thanks for hosting. Um, so yeah, as the introduction, I think gave a relatively good uh, 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 sense of what we'll be doing over the next uh, roughly hour. Um, we just wanted to point out a couple of things that, you know, we'll be talking about some of the key kind of scenes or themes or people who we met in the, over the course of reporting the book. Um, but it's by no means an exhaustive survey of the things that, that are uh, inside the covers of Until Proven Safe. Um, it's a pretty wide ranging book with, um, you know, travel, uh, with looks at quarantine beyond the human sphere. So we look at uh, some, some stuff that we'll talk about tonight. Uh, quarantine in an agricultural context and that kind of thing. Um, but there's much that uh, is, is left uh, outside of, I think, this presentation. Um, so if perhaps you've already read the book or if you want to know a little bit more about what's in it, if we haven't discussed it, um, by all means, feel free to uh, scan the QR code and uh, leave a question. And we, we can circle back to that at the end. 
Um, so uh, just to jump right in, uh, somewhat ironically, actually, the very first sentence of our book, uh, the opening scene of the books, uh, takes place just outside Seattle. Um, uh, when we were coming to the end of our reporting and writing of the actual book itself, uh, as, as everyone uh, tuned in now um, knows, suddenly something very dramatic happened, which was COVID-19. Um, and so we had just come to the end of a reporting uh, process many, many years. We started reporting this and traveling for it in uh, 2016. Um, we'd been looking at the history of quarantine, where quarantine might go next. Um, we had been visiting quarantine stations throughout the Mediterranean and the Adriatic and even here in the United States, um, you know, uh, places that are now in states of ruin, uh, places that are now, you know, uh, just, just uh, you know, uh, modern uh, hospitals and that kind of thing, um, only for this incredible event to happen outside Seattle uh, as COVID-19 really kind of kicked off. Um, and so in March of 2020, um, there was a day that uh, was captured on film where a King County Health Department van rolled up in front of an Econo Lodge, um, an individual wearing what appeared to be hazmat clothing, but was really just sort of, um, uh, you know, like painter's gear, um, hopped out of the back of the van, had a, uh, a, a paint roller on an extension arm, uh, and just started painting the still glowing sign black. Um, it was uh, many, many things, one of which was just evocative of, of uh, what it means to take something out of everyday life and turn it into a place of liminality or of, of quarantine. You know, if we just paint the sign black, we give it a whole new meaning. Um, so in an act of negation, uh, a motel became a frontline medical infrastructure. Um, but it also gave the, act as it happens, correct implication that the United States just simply wasn't ready for mass quarantine. Um, that despite the fact that we had hundreds and hundreds of years uh, building up to this moment, um, that we had seen quarantine stations, also known as lazarettos, all over the world, um, you know, we were left to finding cheap roadside motels that we could purchase uh, sort of haphazardly by with funds from local uh, health uh, groups uh, or health agencies and just uh, retrofit them and turn them into places of quarantine. And so um, there's many, many things that we could say about that, but I would say that maybe the most in important takeaway would be that during uh, while COVID-19 was still unfolding, um, and that gave us a whole new thing of uh, a whole new uh, uh, theme to, to research, um, we got in touch with a man named Todd Seminite, who was the head of the Army Corps of Engineers at the time. Um, and so the Army Corps of Engineers were the people that were tasked with coming up with how exactly we would build for quarantine. So how do we create the infrastructure for medical isolation? Um, how do we find places where people can be can be uh, can stay, where they can be kept, uh, you know, free from harm, but also uh, free from harming others? Um, and so some of the other, you know, sort of photogenic things that we saw were things like uh, convention centers being turned into mass quarantine facilities with cots and pop-up walls that looked like something out of an open plan office. Uh, and the Army Corps of Engineers were the people that were were asked to figure out how to do that. And so, of course, you know, uh, General Seminite, uh, who has since retired, um, you know, led us through the, the process by which the Army Corps of Engineers realized that we're surrounded, in a sense, by quarantine facilities, kind of hiding in plain sight, waiting to be activated. Um, and so the Army Corps of Engineers figured out that the, the cookie cutter aspect of the American built landscape, you know, where every motel looks like every other motel or every suburb or exurb resembles the one for the city, the next city down the, down the freeway. Um, where, where uh, college dormitories or um, sports facilities or convention centers all fundamentally kind of look like one another. Um, ironically, that may not be very, you know, um, aesthetically or poetically uh, pleasing, but it's actually very good from a logistical point of view in terms of figuring out how to develop a kit that will allow us to retrofit all of that and turn it into sites of quarantine. Um, and so the, the core figured out things like how to trick air conditioning systems so that you could go into, say, a Marriott or an Econo Lodge or a Holiday Inn uh, and make the individual HVAC uh, vents in people's rooms and the controls um, sort of trick them into forming negative air pressure bubbles so that you could actually help contain a respiratory virus inside a room or make sure that other people wouldn't be exposed to it. Um, eventually, they even developed things like an at-home kit so that you could go to, say, Home Depot, uh, and you can get those kind of zip-up plastic walls so that if someone is doing renovation work in, the, in one room uh, of your house, you can seal off all the dust and debris uh, inside a kind of plastic bubble. Well, what if that plastic bubble could be used for quarantine? Um, and so the core really kind of developed these really interesting ways to, to transform the built environment of the United States into a quarantine ready landscape. Um, but there's many things that are that uh, were, were, were pointed out where that came clear from that one is that we spend millions and millions of dollars retrofitting things that have already been constructed. 
But if you look at other cultures that are very uh, prepared for disasters and have built dual use uh, function into their, into their facilities, uh, a good example would be Japan and its earthquake preparedness. Um, you've got uh, building code that is already calling for an emergency secondary uses to be built into things like convention centers or even literally the streetscape itself. And so why not do that for the next time? So when the next quarantine comes, when the, when the next pandemic, you know, uh, COVID-32 or whatever it might be, um, when that hits, we don't need to spend millions of dollars and waste months of our time because we already have the facilities, uh, you know, waiting for us to effectively kind of move into them. Um, uh, so the takeaway that I think uh, is worth focusing on here is that we learned quite a lot from COVID-19 in terms of where the built environment is uh, and whether or not it's, it's ready for quarantine. Um, and we realize, of course, that it isn't, uh, but that we might be ready next time and that we have this opportunity to look ahead uh, architecturally and logistically and figure out what quarantine needs. Um, but the one theme that Nikki, I think, is going to address uh, coming up is that we can think of it architecturally, but we need to think about it experientially. Yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the things that's fascinating about the COVID-19 experience is that as Jeff said, we have been working on this book for years. Um, and for what we, we, we were close to what we thought was done when um, you know COVID-19 uh, broke out. And I think what the experience of COVID-19 for us was just one endless um, sort of uh, uh, face palm because we just <laughs> kept seeing sort of the same mistakes that we had seen historically play out again and again. One of them is, is this question of where do you quarantine? Logistically, how does that happen? Another was this question of what is the experience of quarantine? Um, quarantine for public health officials, we came to realize is they, they mentally think of it as just another public health intervention. Um, so when numbers start rising, they say, oh, here's a way to break the chain of transmission, flatten the curve, that expression we all heard a lot of. Um, back in 2020, and and you know they say let's let's institute quarantine, and and as if it's a sort of a drug or a pharmaceutical or something that will just kind of work as intended, and it does work on a numbers level, but quarantine is a is a experience that happens to people, and it has to happen somewhere, and people have to live through it, and so this idea of of quarantine as an experience, I mean I think. Uh, when we were researching the book, um, one of the funny things was we went to an enormous effort to track down someone who had experienced quarantine. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, it was not that easy before COVID-19. And when we finally met this guy who had had a potential Ebola exposure and being put in quarantine to see if he developed the disease, we were so thrilled. We interviewed him. He was going to be our sort of quarantine, voice of quarantine. But um, and then, of course, everyone <laughs> experienced it. But I think what we all learned through first-hand experience and what we had seen from the history is that quarantine is boring. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean by that is not that our book is boring, far, far from it, <laughs> but that the experience itself is often really boring. And this is something you see going back to the Black Death in, you know, Genoa and in the 1600s, you get um, you know, the priest in charge of managing a, a quarantine hospital, a lazaretto as they were called, writing a letter saying, what can I tell, you know, these, these people in quarantine that they can do? Um, and, you know, the, the archbishop writes back uh, suggesting prayer and um, maybe they could make, um, you know, do some laundry and make bandages for the, the sick. Um, so it's kind of like sewing face masks and, uh, and I guess watching Netflix. I mean, so uh, there's a few, there are a couple of interesting things about that, you know, to, to dive into. One is that, you know, we know quarantine is boring. The reasons for that are sort of interesting. I mean, one is that the sort of, the things that we choose to do in everyday life can feel intolerable when they're all we can do. So you might think an evening of Netflix on the couch is delightful uh, when you have many, many other options, but when it's the only thing you can do, it becomes um, incredibly tedious. But, but more importantly, um, quarantine 
and the boredom of quarantine is a sign that we're not finding what we're doing meaningful. We called up a quarantine, I mean, a boredom researcher to get to the, the bottom of this. There are such people. Um, and, and she said, yeah, quarantine is just a sign that you're not engaged um, with what you're doing. You're not finding purpose in it. Um, and what's interesting about that is, first of all, the experience of boredom um, causes people to, it, it's, an, it's an extremely negative experience and, and not just in emotionally, but also in the sense that people um, behave in worse ways when they're bored. So one of her studies, which um, has the amazing name, the jerk study, uh, she would make people watch a really boring video of a rock for 20 minutes and then give them the option to do something mean um, and, and or do nothing at all um, and stay bored. Um, the mean thing would be either taking money away from people for no reason, or um, she also set up a uh, pretend uh, worm shredding station where you could, um, it, it looked as if you were shredding earthworms. And what she found is that when people are bored, they will do a bad thing rather than do nothing at all. On the other hand, when people are bored and you give them a good thing they could possibly do, an altruistic thing, they will also do that rather than nothing at all. And the reason I, um, I think this study is so interesting is because it shows the importance of designing quarantine as an experience. If we just let people get bored um, and, and that there's, there's no positive outlet, you know, it's 50-50 it's what opportunity they will, they will come across. Um, and it might easily not be a constructive, positive one. But if we can give people a way to feel engaged and to feel that what they're doing is meaningful, meaningful which after all it is, um, they are making a sacrifice for public health. Um, they're essentially doing something heroic for the greater good. It just doesn't feel that way right now. Um, but if we could design quarantine so it felt like a meaningful experience, it felt like a chosen experience, and perhaps it felt less of a lonely experience, um, it, that would be a huge step forward in quarantine design. And so the, the, uh, the experience aspect of quarantine is fascinating. And one positive um, uh, sort of potential, this is a, this is a little, little side note, but in the past, quarantine has been a um, a great breeding ground for romance and finding common ground between people. So um, not only during COVID-19 was there a, a boom in quarantine erotica, but actually in previous centuries in the 1800s when um, sort of tourism first started to be an option, you know, steamships and railways and people started to travel. Uh, there was a little mini boom in quarantine romance and a lot of short stories about finding common ground because we were all locked up together and going through the same experience. And so um, I, I offer that as, a, as an example of how quarantine can bring people together um, while we're alone. Mm. <laughs> yeah, some of, some of the titles for the uh, quarantine erotica during COVID uh, were, were interesting. I, maybe, maybe we'll refrain from saying them, but you can, you can, you can Google quarantine erotica uh, after, after the event. COVID-69. Was one of them. But um, so, you know, we've been, we've been using the word quarantine throughout the presentation. And of course, it's obviously in the subtitle of our book. Um, but I think it's important to just take a brief sort of aside and uh, define these terms and make sure it's clear exactly what we're talking about. Um, and so often people use the words quarantine and isolation relatively interchangeably. They'll say quarantine when they mean isolation or vice versa. Um, but there's a very, very interesting and important difference. Um, so quarantine requires uncertainty. Uh, quarantine means that you do not know if you're infected or if someone else is infected or if something is a danger or a threat. Um, it's a way of engaging with something that you don't know uh, and taking that thing that is unknown um, and basically buffering it. So uh, uh, taking an exposure to it or an encounter with it uh, and adding a little bit of delay, uh, putting it on an island, for example, instead of letting uh, merchants come into the city, they have to anchor away from the city and sort of stay literally at bay. Um, you know, taking goods and putting them in a separate room from the people who brought them to see if they have anything that might be infectious or susceptible that, that was, that was uh, in that shipment of goods. Um, whereas isolation means that you actually do know that someone is infected. Um, so if you have COVID-19, for example, and you know you have COVID-19 and you're staying home, then you're in a state of isolation, not a state of quarantine. And so 
I think the reason why that's such an important difference is that uh, it lends a metaphoric and kind of religious, even poetic uh, resonance to the notion of quarantine. Um, there may be something inside of you that is waiting to emerge, uh, something that is a threat to others, uh, something that is a danger to yourself, um, you know, that has religious overtones. Um, and in fact, that's reflected in the very uh, conceptual practice of quarantine. Um, so it's quite interesting to point out, for example, that when quarantine was first invented in the, in the late 1300s in the Adriatic Sea region, where there were port cities uh, trading with the Near East, cities like Dubrovnik and Venice and the Venetian Empire, or uh, Venetian Republic, um, they were sort of on the front lines of encounter with uh, potential germs and potential infections and diseases. Um, but so the first quarantines were only 30 days in duration. Um, they were a Trentina, uh, and they, that was gradually expanded to a Quarantina, which was a 40-day period of time, uh, and comes from the Venetian dialect 440, um, because 40 days had religious overtones. Um, it was the same amount of time that Jesus Christ allegedly spent in the desert, um, it's the same uh, number of days uh, and nights that there were rain in the story of Noah's Ark. Um, 40 was just sort of a biblical shorthand. It's almost like saying a baker's dozen. It was a number that had resonance with people and they understood what it was. It was a spiritually significant span of time. And so if you said, hey, go isolate yourself for 40 days, uh, that becomes quarantine uh, when one, it's tied back to religious uh, time periods like 40 but also when you don't know what is going to emerge and if something will emerge from someone. Um, and so I just say that because it's important to understand exactly why we wrote a book about quarantine and not a book about medical isolation. And, and as Jeff is sort of saying, it is that uncertainty and that suspicion that really makes quarantine so interesting. I mean, one mm -hmm. of the, the things that, for example, is really fascinating about quarantine is that unlike almost everything else in Anglo-Saxon law, in quarantine, you're essentially guilty until proven innocent. You are potentially dangerous until proven safe. And that makes it this very powerful um, tool, but it also makes it something that is very prone to abuse because because it is based on uncertainty and suspicion, it is prone to bias. And that's something that we've seen again and again. Of course, we saw it um, at this uh, during COVID-19 where certain groups were singled out as, as being potential carriers and, and, and treated differently. But th that is woven through the history of quarantine. Um, and one of the stories we tell in the book about this is I think a very little known um, story of one of the, the largest sort of recent mass quarantine in American history before COVID-19. Now, most people would say that'd be the 1918 flu. And certainly that's the one that gets written about in the history books, um, but there's a forgotten uh, quarantine that is that is more recent, uh, although uh, it began earlier, it went on for longer, and, um, and also a mass quarantine and has just sort of been erased from the history books. It's called the American Plan, um, which is a very Orwellian name for what was essentially a public health um, campaign that targeted um, quote unquote loose women. So it started in 1917 as the United States was entering World War I and there was a concern um, about venereal disease. And um, as anyone who has been to sex ed knows, uh, venereal disease can be spread by both men and women, but um, health authorities felt that loose women were the problem, um, threatening men and the innocent women that they would go on to marry. Um, and so the American plan was introduced uh, in order that public health authorities would be able to detain women on suspicion of spreading venereal disease. And it was used um, uh, to lock up thousands in, in potentially tens of thousands of women. It's very hard to kind of put together the records because they're all fragmented at the state level. There is a historian called Scott Stern who came across this as a PhD student. Um, it hadn't been written about and he has kind of pulled the data together, but, uh, but a lot is still not known. And it's an amazing example of sort of the dangers uh, and the potential abuse of quarantine because uh, this idea of potential suspicion then gets sort of uh, 
used to target women for all sorts of spurious reasons. I mean, African-American women were locked up at a much higher rate than white women, unsurprisingly. Women were locked up because they were seen dining alone at a restaurant. Um, they were locked up because uh, they owed rent and um, their landlord, you know, wanted to get revenge. They were locked up for uh, being seen to drink whiskey, even though it was actually prescribed for their case of tuberculosis. Um, so these, the, you know, and again, these laws stayed on the books for years, um, women being detained on this suspicion. And I think what that leads us to in the book, and there's a, it's part of a much longer discussion about this sort of these dangers inherent in the quarantine powers, is this idea that if you're being asked to um, restrict your movement on suspicion alone, um, that there better be uh, a sort of bill of rights for the quarantined as well. And we, we talk about in the, in the book, you know, what that might consist of, what some examples are. But I think the idea that um, this power is a dangerous one, it has been abused throughout history. But again, as with sort of the idea of the infrastructure of quarantine and the experience of quarantine, we know how to redesign it and we know how to put in those protections. We just need to do it. And to go back to some of the other things that we've in included in the book, there's a figure named John Howard uh, who kind of organized a lot of our research and a lot of our travels uh, initially back in 2016. Um, and so I thought I'd just do a little bit kind of introduction to John Howard and, and his, his life story and then what that led us to. Um, so John Howard, if you've heard of him, would be as a British prison reformer. Um, he, this was in the 1700s, uh, where he was the wealthy son, the heir of a, a father who had worked in the upholstery trade uh, in furnishings. And he spent the equivalent, the modern day equivalent of millions and millions of dollars of, his, of, of that inherited money um, traveling around Europe, visiting prisons, jails, and dungeons. Um, the idea was that he thought architecture should have a humanitarian effect. Um, it should have a, an actually positive uh, impact on people, but also not be used as a form of punishment. Um, and so, of course, when you're going to a prison, a jail, or a dungeon, you know, punishment is seemingly the very purpose. Um, but what he wanted to do was look into the conditions with, under which people were being held in incarceration. And so everything from the weighing how much bread they got every day, um, how many windows there might be, if there were windows at all, um, if they were on, you know, uh, timber or stone floors versus just mud and water, uh, vermin and rats, all, all kinds of things. Um, but what John Howard noticed uh, during these trips in the 1700s was that there were other facilities in town, sometimes close to the prisons, um, but they looked a lot like prisons, and those were quarantine stations. Um, there were lazarettos, as, as we've said a few times. And so John Howard, uh, when he was already now in his 60s, uh, decided that he would embark on a whole new tour of Europe. And so he started going around to port cities. Uh, and sometimes, you know, uh, he lived a really adventurous life uh, in the sense that, you know, he had to sneak into these places. He had to pretend to be somebody that he wasn't. Uh, he was wanted by French authorities and had to flee the country. Uh, he was involved in pirate scuffles uh, in the Mediterranean, you know, which was a very wild sea at the time. Um, and uh, I traveled as far east as, as what is now uh, U the uh, Ukraine. And so what we wanted to do in reading his, his work and noticing the places that John Howard had visited, places like Malta and Venice, um, places that are in the Mediterranean or the Adriatic Seas and are very known for their histories of quarantine, um, we wanted to also visit some of these places and some of these sites and see what was quarantine like 600 years ago, 500 years ago. Um, and that set the basis for some travels that we did in uh, beginning in 2016 and really kind of extending, I'd say, all the way up to COVID-19. Um, but the question of where would a 21st century John Howard go to, um, not in the sense that we are moral crusaders, but in the sense of a, of a quarantine tourist, say, somebody who wants to visit sites of quarantine, um, it's an interesting question because actually there's not a lot of places that you, at first glance, that you can actually go. Um, quarantine has, an, has a peculiar relationship with history in that um, it's a temporary experience. It's a liminal experience. That is to say, it's, uh, it's in between uh, certain aspects aspects of, of urban design. It's, a per, it's often a peripheral experience, so it's out there somewhere. It's out on an island, and it's out on a peninsula. It's, not, it's generally not right here in the center with us. Um, and as we'll see, I'm sure, with COVID-19, and as we've seen with many other uh, pandemics, um, people want to forget. They want to move on. Um, they, the last thing they do is want, want to do is talk about quarantine or talk about the pandemic that they just lived through. Um, and a lot of quarantine stations, too, were temporary. Um, you know, they were built out of wood and then set fire to at the very end so that you could fully disinfect it. 
And so the idea of a permanent quarantine station that has survived to the 21st century was actually, it's, it's, it's less common than, than one might think. Um, and so that set up the challenge of kind of an itinerary for where, where to go and what to see. Um, and so briefly, I'll just mention a couple. Um, you know, we went to uh, Dubrovnik, which is the city where quarantine was really formally invented in 1377. And there's many, many fossils of quarantine, so to speak, you know, building remnants that are still in the, in, in the, be the beautiful city of Dubrovnik um, that were definitely worth visiting. But it was actually Venice where quarantine was kind of perfected. Um, it's a city of islands already, which means that it's very easy to isolate people. You can just put them on an island and, and, and cut them off. Um, and even Venice itself is a, is a, the neighborhoods can be on different islands and separated only by bridges and that kind of thing. Um, it's no coincidence historically that Venice is also the city where the ghetto was invented. Um, the city's entire Jewish population was forced to live in one neighborhood. Um, and that neighborhood was, was uh, sealed off by gates where they had to be inside those gates every night. And so quarantine is just kind of a medical extension of that kind of logic. Um, there's so much more that I could go into here. Uh, you know, Malta it was a particularly fascinating place. Um, it's one of the largest quarantine stations in the world for its time period. Um, everybody from um, the, 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 the king of Abyssinia uh, to Byron, the poet, the British poet, uh, who, uh, who wrote his name on the wall uh, and, and wrote poetry about quarantine uh, when, when he was released. Um, but that was also a, a, a place that figures large in our, in our travelogue. Um, however, there's many other places that we're now about to come into, so I'll, I'll throw it over to Nikki again, but where we realized that that 21st century John Howard would need to look beyond human quarantine to find other sites where quarantine is taking place today. And actually, one of the quarantine stations, that re historical quarantine stations that remains is in Sydney, Australia, in the north head of Sydney Harbor. Mm -hmm. um, and that is really where our book began, but it began thinking, oh, weird, here's a historical quarantine station. Why is quarantine a thing of the past? Um, and why don't we need this anymore? Um, and of course, you know, the minute you start going down that path, you realize actually quarantine is still incredibly necessary. But um, as Jeff said, a lot of the historical quarantine stations and the sort of physical, uh, what would be a monument to quarantine, I guess, um, just aren't there. And, and, and both the physical sense and in public memory, quarantine just gets erased. Um, but it, it, it's sort of, um, it, but it's woven through, through uh, everything. And a lot of the places that you see it nowadays are actually non-human, as Jeff said. So a large chunk of the book is devoted to looking at quarantine, sort of a, what we say across scales and across species, um, even down to you know other species that use quarantine. Mm. Um, but one of the uh, one of the sections looks at actually extraterrestrial quarantine, planetary quarantine, and so I figured we'd tell you a little bit about that tonight, um, since it's one of my favorites. Uh, the idea of planetary quarantine um, was invented in the 1950s when humans realized they were first about to be able to. Um, leave Earth, there were, there were rockets, and it seemed possible that we might one day set foot on other planets. And um, scientists at the time said, you know, we are going to be entering um, another biosphere that has evolved without uh, human intervention. Um, the last time humans did that, when Columbus set sail from Europe to the Americas, the result was um, an enormous number of lives lost. We'll never know how many, but some estimates say, you know, one in 10 um, people in the Americas died uh, due to disease brought by the Europeans. Um, so can we do better than Columbus? And, there, and the uh, result was planetary quarantine. It's a set of international agree agreements. There are planetary protection offers, officers whose job is to enforce that this. The U.S. has one. Um, it's currently a guy we met while we were researching the book. Uh, we also met his two predecessors, who were both women. Um, uh, the European Space Agency has one, who we also met. JAXA has one. So these planetary protection officers uh, have responsibility for uh, protecting outer space from Earth, which is called forward contamination. Um, and, the, and the process that takes is, is kind of interesting because it, it basically involves sterilizing everything we send into space. But if, uh, as I mentioned, quarantine is an example of uncertainty, planetary quarantine is sort of a fractal level of uncertainty because we have no idea what 
what is capable of surviving the journey into space? What might uh, be capable of surviving on uh, an extraterrestrial body? Whether there's even life on an extraterrestrial body in the first place, and if so, whether it's capable of being harmed by human by earth life or um or even causing harm to earth life so the level of uncertainty is incredible um in there there's a several ironies involved in all of this um one for example is that in um trying to make our spacecraft super clean um and free of all life to send them to places like you know uh that we think might have had life, might still have life, like Mars, um, we inadvertently encourage some of this, the toughest species on Earth, what are called extremophiles. Um, we sort of, we, we select for them and, and send them there. So the, the former chief science officer at, at NASA told us, you know, we know there's life on Mars because we sent it there. Mm. Um, so, and the the uh, the bacteria that they will find in these clean rooms where the spacecraft are assembled, where we visited uh, for the book, um, they are the same bacteria that you will find living on deep sea thermal vents or incredibly hostile uh, acidic um, springs or um, very dry, arid deserts. Um, they're, they're the toughest of the tough. So that, that's kind of an interesting feature of it. The other interesting thing is there's the question of back um, contamination. So this is bringing um, potential space germs back to Earth. And that hasn't been much of a concern since the Apollo days. And in the book, we go into detail and, and how um, you know we dealt with that during the Apollo project, including this backup plan to bury the Apollo astronauts alive. Um, which we can talk about in the Q and A, but it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting topic to be thinking about right now because, as some of you will have seen in the news, um, Percy Perseverance, the the rover that is currently on the surface of Mars, has just drilled its first rock sample, and the idea is that that eventually will make its way to Earth in in a little more than a decade's time, and the uh, so currently, the, the US, the European Union, their respective uh, you know, uh, CDCs and environmental protection agencies and all of these agencies are trying to figure out, well, how do we do that? Who has the authority to uh, certify these Martian samples as safe? How are we going to determine they're safe? How do you test? Martian rocks to see whether they contain something harmful to Earth life. All of these questions still need to be answered and they're being thrashed out right now. So it's kind of an interesting time to be um, thinking about planetary protection aside from all the sort of the um, analogies to human quarantine. Um, and I think that's one of the, the things that sort of struck us uh, looking at these non-human quarantines is how much quarantine logic sort of carries over from one realm into the next. And, and we'll go into another realm with Jeff. Um, yeah, and then I, I, one more, uh, uh, and, and like I say, there's many things that we're, we won't have uh, time to get into, although we may be able to touch on some stuff in the Q&A. Um, for example, we even look at nuclear waste isolation, um, and we probably won't have time to get into that today. Um, but another, another uh, sphere, another non-human sphere of quarantine that uh, really struck us and seems like possibly the most relevant in the years to come um, is agricultural quarantine. Um, so the quarantining of species other than humans in order to prevent uh, the spread of diseases that might affect crops or, or animals, vegetation and animals. Um, and so I'd say somewhat ominously, I think, you know, one of the things we learned and, and heard again and again um, is that we, you know, as one person phrases it in the book, you know, we're only one pathogen away from starvation. Um, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but nevertheless, the threat to our food supply um, and the threat to entire ecosystems um, is very, very real. And experts have been warning about it for years now, uh, to, the, to the extent that it sounds eerily like what people were warning about in, up until uh, the outbreak of COVID-19. Everyone knew a global pandemic was on its way. Um, everyone knew it would affect, uh, you know, uh, international travelers, it would affect supply chains, it would affect, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the way that society is run. In, the economy. In, yeah, the economy, uh, in, internal to individual countries. 
And they're saying the same thing now, the, the uh, agricultural and, um, and uh, medical experts who we talked to about plant and animal quarantine. Um, and so a couple of things that I think are, are worth pointing out. Um, one of the individuals that we met and, and spoke to for the book was uh, a man named Richard Myers. He's now the president of Kansas State University, um, but was previously the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, right when 9-11 uh, first happened or happened. And so he was actually one of the people that was briefed when um, U.S. Green Berets came across a list of pathogens in an Al-Qaeda cave in Afghanistan um, that listed a whole series of uh, possible targets that they wanted to weaponize. Um, and so what was eerie about that was that some of them, of course, affected human beings, but you know, at least half the list were uh, diseases that affected animals and plants. And so the idea was that they were going to target the global food supply. Um, that has led uh, uh, many, many things, including that have led uh, uh, General Myers, who's now President Myers at Kansas State University, uh, to help dedicate that university to being kind of the Silicon Valley of biodefense. Um, and so we went there to see the sort of the front lines of animal quarantine, animal research, and, and where these kinds of super virulent path pathogens are being studied. Um, and so that's actually one of the geographic lessons I think that's quite uh, compelling about quarantine is that, you know, we've mentioned several times now that quarantine takes place out on the edges of things. It's a peripheral activity. Um, you know, you deliberately want to keep it out of the city so that you can't affect people in it. But now because of advanced engineering controls and very, very fine air handling systems and that kind of thing, um, quarantine just happens right in the center of everything. Um, and so the reason why I mentioned that is because this place in Kansas State University is right in this, the center of the country, but it's, it's also right in the center of, of of, of cattle culture and of, of US uh, agricultural production. But it used to be um, the, the, pl the place that, that studied animal pathogens um, on the tip of Long Island uh, was a place called Plum Island. Um, it, was this, it was subject to many, many, many conspiracy theories about it being the secret origin of Lyme disease and all of these things. Um, but the fact that we're taking a facility like that, which is being closed down and being shipped now moved to Manhattan, Kansas, um, I think is an indication of where quarantine is going from the edges of things to the very center of them, which, and I mean that both literally and metaphorically in terms of where the kind of new age of quarantine that we're moving into. And I think that um, I we're going to open it up for Q&A, but I think I would, I, before we do that, I would leave with uh, two things. One, uh, we are entering a new age of quarantine. I think that, is, that much is certain. When we used to talk about this book before COVID-19, we used to tell people, um, you are going to experience quarantine, mass quarantine in your lifetime. Um, we were, you know, public health officials knew um, that a global pandemic was on its way. We went to multiple kind of role-playing scenarios where they gamed it out. Um, we went to a, a role-playing scenario where uh, international officials, including the head of the Chinese CDC, gamed out what to do if a novel coronavirus emerged in October 2019. Mm. So um, we did know that this was on its way, not in a conspiracy theory way, in a it was bound to happen way. Um, and, uh, and I think it, similarly, we can say with confidence, it will happen again. We are entering a new age of quarantine, which is part of the urgency of our book. And I think we're not going to, you know, this is something, uh, again, that may come up in the Q&A, but at the end of the book, we look at some of the future of quarantine, which is increasingly sort of being seen as this area that's ripe for kind of high tech disruption. And can we use algorithms and surveillance and location tracking and AI to sort of do a smart version of quarantine where we... Um, that will be less kind of blunt and brute force and allow economies to keep working and so on. And I think um, in the book, we look at a lot of the, uh, we look at the potential of that. We also look at a lot of the potential pitfalls of that. And we also end with something that we didn't realize we were gonna end with, which, uh, you know, when we, but having seen COVID-19 play out, we wrote an epilogue that is essentially a manifesto um, for reinventing quarantine. And that's yeah, that's something that I think we both feel is we must not make these mistakes again. We've make, made them uh, you know, too many times throughout history to, to not have learned. Um, but with that, yeah, we have lots of things we'd be happy to talk about in the Q&A, apocalypse, nuclear waste, Ebola bubbles, how many times we had to take our clothes off for this book, which is a lot. Mm. Um, but we have some questions already, so we can, um, we can dive in. Is there anything you wanna jump into straight away? Um, sure, yeah, I might start with, uh, 
there's a question here. Um, I don't know who the questions are from, so so forgive us if we can't identify you. Um, they're they're kind of anonymized for us. Um, there's a question that says, in your book, it says, over the past six centuries, quarantine has shaped the public health response to infectious disease around the world, but it has also shaped our streets, buildings, and cities, our borders, laws, identities, and imaginations. Um, do you find that people limit quarantine to public health and nothing else? Um, yeah, it's a great question. I think that, um, and it's a, it's a kind of an editorial question um, in the sense of it's the, the kind of thing our editor would have, would, would ask. Um, but uh, yes, actually, I do think people limit quarantine, um, not only to public health, but to the sense that it's this endlessly tedious process where, oh, you know, we just have to quarantine. Um, you know, they go home and there's no plan. Um, or they use quarantine as a metaphor, maybe because your your emails, you know, sus suspicious emails get quarantined. But what we really were drawn to in the initial research, and I think why we wanted to write the book, and what I I think we achieved with the book, um, was showing exactly just how ubiquitous quarantine is. It really is at the center of how our modern world has taken shape. Um, it's affected things like the passports. You know, there's a lot of controversy right now about vaccine uh, COVID pa uh, passports. You know, to show that you have a vaccine in order to go to a restaurant or to fly to England or that kind of thing. Um, but the, the passport itself has medical origins uh, date, dating back to health papers during the Black Death, um, specifically in Italy, you know, where people would use um, uh, a, a basically a document that, that described your physical appearance because it didn't have photographs, obviously. Uh, and it would say that you were coming from a, uh, a, a part of uh, Italy that did not have the um, the Black Death, and so that you could be, you would, they would let you into the next city, uh, and you wouldn't need to quarantine. Um, but so it's those health papers that set the set the the the, the terms for what we now call a passport. But then so similarly, as as the question indicated, there's even international borders uh, that are hardened from where colonial powers had quarantine inspection stations. And so a seemingly random moment of medical uh, uh, imp imp imperium um, became hardened into what is now a, a, an actual state border. Um, and so we look at many examples of that. And then also just briefly, interestingly too, um, you know, some of these things like the Cordon Sanitaire, which was a, a very broad uh, expanse of land that basically separated Christian Europe from the Ottoman Empire. Um, and there's, there's a, you know, obviously much more to be said about the Cordon Sanitaire. Um, but one of the interesting side effects was that the region of central Southeastern Europe where the Cordon Sanitaire was um, eventually became kind of the, the haunting ground for European vampire folktales. And so the vampire as this liminal figure that was neither alive nor dead, it was infected, but not, and it, you know, it, it, it preyed on people and it existed at night and it was both animal and human. Um, you know, all of those things that went into vampire folklore really kind of come out of a zone of quarantine. And so, you know, we can go into much more detail, but yes, I think we really wanted to try to rescue quarantine as it were from the medical, you know, ghetto quote unquote that it would be in and really kind of show that it's a, it's a universally fascinating and, and ubiquitous topic. Absolutely. And so uh, another question, when COVID-19 struck, when did, to, when did you two know you wanted to add this pandemic to the book you've been working on for years? And was it difficult to include? I mean, that's a great question because mm -hmm. um, there was a sort of two simultaneous urges to kind of, um, uh, wouldn't it be great to have this book out right now when COVID-19 <laughs> happened? That's what our editor thought. Certainly. That's what our yeah. editor thought. That's what we thought. I mean, honestly, <laughs> yeah. um, so that yeah. as people were going through this novel quarantine experience, um, you know, we could share the lessons of history. Um, but at the same time, what we had managed to do with um, in terms of researching the book meant that prior to COVID-19 meant that we had this sort of incredible access to people who were now putting their quarantine um, plans into practice in real time. So for example, the chief scientific advisor to the Italian government is someone we had met and spent time with in Venice when we were researching the book. The um, head of the Division of Quarantine and Global Migration at the CDC is someone that we had spent um, you know, years talking to at that point about how quarantine should work, what the dangers were of quarantine, how to reform quarantine. Um, and so to, to be able to call them up while um, COVID-19 was going on and say, okay, we talked to you for years about sort of uh, how you think about quarantine as a public health official and you know um at the cdc they sort of led an effort to reform quarantine um to be able to call them up and and then hear what was 
hard about implementing that during COVID-19 and what sort of didn't work in real life, what they learned, um, what they would do differently. That was too good not to incorporate, basically. So yeah, mm. I would say, uh, and, and for us, I think weaving the contemporary experience in through the history really helped bring the history to, li uh, to life. You know, we thought the history was fascinating and relevant because we knew another pandemic was on its way, but I think COVID really helps make that case for us. So mm. weaving it in was, was actually, you know, helps bring it to life. Yeah. You yeah, want to take another one? I'm uh, sure. Um, there's a, I think uh, there's a question, um, why is it that the boredom of quarantine is a problem for some? We were bored before COVID. Why isn't the sacrifice for the greater good inspiration enough to quarantine? Um, yeah, I think that's also a, a very good question. Uh, and it's an active question in the sense that um, it's kind of the question, you know, why is quarantining such a, an issue? Um, I think that one of the things that we go into in the book, and I think Nikki in particular was so good at researching and, 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 and teasing out, um, was just that it hasn't been thought through from an experiential point of view. Um, you know, she mentioned that earlier in our in our talk this evening. Um, but you know, quarantine is the kind of thing where you know we just say, and we saw this even with these simulations that Nikki was describing. You know, the disease would get very bad in a simulated exercise, and then the team would say, okay, we're going to quarantine the, the the people now, and 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 then and then and then they just cut to a coffee break. And so quarantine was just this thing that basically meant like, okay, this is where we're done. We're not going to think about it. Um, you know, quarantine is what, you know, when when someone on the, you know, public health official just says, okay, just quarantine, just stay home. Um, there are questions that they aren't asking, such as, do you have a house that you can stay in? Um, are you on a business trip? Can you afford the hotel that you're in that you now have to spend two weeks in uh, on your own dime or your company's dime? Who are you um, responsible for caring for? Totally. Yeah. Is your, or do you have a multi-generation household so that your grandparents live with you or, you know, new in, um, immunocompromised uh, family members can't get away from you because you live in a, in a house that doesn't have enough space? Um, so all of these kinds of unanswered questions about what exactly you would do during quarantine, um, I think really kind of led to the sense that that uh, boredom and uh, frustration with it, uh, it came to, came to the fore. But I think more importantly, quarantine just simply isn't, I mean, it's almost like a marketing issue in the sense that it isn't even described as being important uh, or in, in the sense that this is something you need to do for the greater good. You need to do this as a national project. It's almost like national mobilization during World War II. Um, you know, we're asking you to make a sacrifice. Um, we're asking you to do this thing for your neighbors, to it's do it not for strangers. It's seen as patriotic. It's not well, seen, it's seen as, as heroic. It's seen as anti-patriotic. You know, it's seen as something that is this un-American, you know, the idea of sacrificing yourself for the greater good is now seen as un-American. Uh, you know, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredibly strange ideological shift from World War II era sort of patriotism. And I think that some of that is just that it isn't communicated about what it is that we're asking, not we, but that, that public health officials are asking people to do. And I think that that would be something that we need to learn uh, from COVID-19. And so that when there is the next mass quarantine or the next global pandemic, um, health officials understand what they're asking. They're asking for sacrifice and they're asking for something that is, as that question indicates, very meaningful um, and very important for the public good, um, but it isn't sold as that. And I think just to add to that, this is something we go into in our in our sort of uh, epilogue slash manifesto, which is this, this idea that, um, and, and it, it happened during COVID-19, a lot of people were advised to shelter in place and there were lockdowns and things like that that were deliberately not called quarantine mm. because um, quarantine laws in quite a few places had been rewritten to give the state a duty of care to the people that they were asking to make sacrifices. Mm. And so it was much more expedient to say, let's shelter in place let's do social distancing, let's be in lockdown, um, and to not uh, trigger an official quarantine with um, the, the sort of responsibilities that come with it. And I, I think that's a, a problem. The, the, entire, um, the entire thing has to be approached as a, as a contract. Um, if you are being asked to make these sacrifices, then, um, you know, the, the authorities who are asking you to make those sacrifices do assume a duty of care 
Um, and there, it shouldn't be, you know, nonprofits stepping into the breach to make sure that you have something to eat if you're if you're quarantined and you can't go out. Um, if you're if you're that is being asked of you for the greater good, then the public must um, also assume a duty of care. And I think that's sort of made explicit in a lot of official quarantine regulations, but wasn't um, uh, made explicit in these sort of more informal lockdowns. And also, honestly, uh, there wasn't a lot of trust that authorities would deliver on the, uh, the things that we might expect if we're making a sacrifice uh, what are they, what are we getting in return? So without trust, um, there's no public health, but with all, but also without a, without a public, there's no public health. And um, these were problems going into the pandemic that sort of were really just exacerbated by it. Hmm. Yeah, just briefly, I'll, I'll add too, because of um, something that he said a, a couple of minutes ago, um, when we interviewed Todd Semenite, the former head of the Army Corps of Engineers, um, he made this really chilling observation, which was that even though the Army Corps had actually converted many facilities, um, you know, hotels and convention centers and that kind of thing into emergency frontline medical uh, isolation and quarantine infrastructure, um, the, he found that local hospitals, because it's a privatized healthcare sy uh, system in the United States, um, the hospitals didn't want to let their, their, their potentially exposed patients go into the Army Corps system. Um, not out of political altruism or some kind of ideological disagreement, but because they could no longer build those patients. And so hospitals were keeping, you know, three, four, five people in a single room because they could charge them and actually get money. Whereas if they said to the Army Corps of Engineers, hey, here's two people that you could very safely and, and, and probably for the greater good, put them into your new quarantine facility, um, they chose not to. And so I just mentioned that because there's, and we talk about this at, at length in the book, there's a, a, a extreme mismatch often um, between short-term goals and long-term goals and between different actors who are in the kind of um, quarantine or medical care space. And uh, that's something that we have to think about too. I think it, it comes down to incentives. And that's something yeah. that we talk about with the future of quarantine too, is if we are um, turning over quarantine to sort of companies who are, um, you know, doing um, sort of this health surveillance, this always on monitoring, using AI um, to, to sort of pull together clues from, you know, how everything from sort of our, our wearable health technology to our Google searches. Um, do those companies have public health as their goal or is their incentive shareholder returns? Um, and I think, you know, these are some things to be careful about with the future of quarantine and that we get it into in the book. I just want to briefly get to one more question. Oh, we don't really have time. It was, well, the best and worst quarantine stations. And I just want to say that I think the, the, the quarantine station that is protecting the world's chocolate supply is a hundred percent my favorite uh, quarantine station. <laughs> it is um, bizarrely uh, this one quarantine station is um, it's outside London, which, um, you know, those of you who have visited the British Isles might know that um, from a climate point of view, they're not necessarily a cacao growing sort of paradise. Um, but that's precisely why the quarantine station is there. And actually, as uh, cacao plants travel the world from one chocolate growing region to another for research purposes, for agronomic purposes, um, for you know, plant breeding, et cetera. Um, they all have to go and spend uh, a two to three year vacation in, in Reading, just outside London in this, in this greenhouse that is sort of uh, heated to make it seem like it's in the tropics um, to see whether they have disease. And chocpocalypse ch is very real. It's a real threat. Um, the cacao plant is subject to uh, terrible yield reducing diseases for which we have no treatments. And if they spread from region to region, as the guy who runs the cacao quarantine center said to us, that would be curtains for chocolate. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I, I mean, given how important chocolate is to me, that's my favorite quarantine station. And I think we should probably uh, wrap it up now that we've gone long, but these were great yeah. questions. So thank, yeah, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Nikki and Jeff, thank you so much for being here tonight. I think this topic of quarantine is always relevant and it's inevitable in the future. So it would be a good idea if we 
you know, had a set in plan. That way we don't keep making these mistakes over and over as history has proven, especially today. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and thank you so much from all of us at Town Hall for being here. And remember to the viewers at home to purchase a copy of the book from our partner bookseller, Third Place Books. And that link can be found in the chat. Thank you both for being here. And everyone, have a great evening. Sure. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.